Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex Borsma. We've been friends since, I think, 2013 or something like that. Something like that. And um, it's been, been quite a journey to see the progress he's taken and the steps he's taken very different from mine. And uh, so it's been fun going back and forth with stories. And we've had experiences together, which we'll talk a little bit about. And um, yeah, so. Uh, Please welcome Alex with me. So I've got a bunch of questions. Basically, I'm going to interview Alex, and uh, he's going to share his story. Um, so as we get started, so Alex, tell us a little bit about um, you know how long you've been in this. Like, how did you start out? Yeah, like no, not not like as an infant, yeah. but as you know, when you start getting into real estate, whatever that looked like, if it was sure. a trade or whatever. Yeah, sure. So, um, I started in construction like right out of high school, and my family has a lot of like business owners and stuff like that. And I'm actually from Alberta, and the original seed, uh, sort of in my mind, was seeing my grandparents actually, who invested in real estate and had a business of their own. Um, and my grandmother sat me down when I was like, I think I was like 17 or something in that range. I don't, I, it was either right before I graduated or right after. And she talked about how um, real estate, their real estate had kind of paid for their retirement. And they were always people that I looked up to as seeing like, they're, you know, doing well financially. They're, they're never talking about how, like, like money, like, or not having enough or lack thereof. And I remember sitting there thinking, um, you know, if they were able to do that with like, and they did it really simply, like they did like a bunch of houses and they would do the, the, the burr basically. And uh, they buy it, flip it for, for themselves, refinance and buy another one kind of deal. And I always thought, I'm like, okay, if you can do that with like 10, what would happen if you did like hundreds of units? And where could that take you over, over a career? Cool. Uh, tell me a little bit more. school <laughs> yeah no right out of high school I was in construction so yeah I, I did construction and then um, uh, met my uh, girlfriend at the time now my wife moved out to Manitoba worked in it for another builder or here um, and uh, was just kind of immersed in the construction industry and eventually uh, I started my own business and at a certain point it made sense to rent and so I had a brother-in-law that uh, him and I had always talked about maybe buying a buying a property together, or investment together, and and I found a piece of land, and, and we just kind of were like, okay, let's let's do it, and uh, that was the first deal that I sort of like developed, which was a piece of land on a corner of uh, Redonda and Gun Road out on Springfield area, right before kind of all that other stuff started going up about ten years ago, and uh, we built a building and then moved my business in there, and I rented out the rest and sort of cool. went from there. I guess, yeah, <laughs> it's like house hacking, but for commercial. We got owner financing, like kind of thing from um, like, a, like a credit union wouldn't be able to do. We got much higher uh, leverage than is typical, and we were able to stretch our dollars quite a bit further than normally you'd be able to, and, and that was huge for us being young um, because we didn't have a lot of cash. So to, to leverage up at the time made a lot of sense. I mean, I would have been like 25, 26, somewhere in there. Maybe, maybe actually, no, maybe a little bit older than that. Yeah, something like that. Something in that range, yeah. It's kind of all a blur. And your, your, your construction company, what, what did you guys focus on? Uh, we did exteriors. Okay. Still do. So I, I'm a part of Above All Roofing. I don't know if any of you guys have heard of us or worked with us. We do a lot of residential. And then, um, actually, what happened was I, I, my business was called Lighthouse Exteriors, and then my, my now partner was above all roofing, and we, we brought our companies together about uh, three years ago now. And um, the purpose of that is actually because I wanted to do more and more real estate full time, and we kind of just, our business has clicked. That, he runs that, I'm doing real estate.
Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so Tony's whole thing is clarity, focus, execution, right? And um, one of the things that seem to come up a lot with your student success stories about people are taking action. And his whole thing is like, get clarity about what you want in life, focus on that, and then execute on it. Like, stop messing around. And um, for me, I always kind of had an idea of what I wanted, and I had done this, this building on Redonda, and we bought this other one on... Uh, Mary and I kind of flipped it, I guess, renovated it and flipped it and sold it and made a little bit of money on each of those. But this, uh, this really got me thinking about like, or challenged me to think about what do I want more of in my life? Like more of, less of, so making lists of like, what do you want? What do you want to, what kind of life do you want to create for yourself? And um, I guess through that, also recognizing that what I value most in my life is my family. And so it was this weird thing where my wife actually wanted to go to school in the States, in California actually. And I remember thinking, okay, you know, my wife's dreams are just as important as mine. And I have these business dreams. My business is going really well. My, my siding company was going really well that year. I was made, made a lot of money. And um, I really felt like it was time to like sacrifice for her dreams and not for mine. So actually we moved and my business took a hit because I wasn't here. I mean, it's not totally surprising. Um, but through that, I actually found a lot of clarity about what I really did want to do, which was to continue to build the real estate business. So, so you guys took off you and Scott for how long? Two years. Two years. Yeah. And, but you continued to run stuff that year? Yeah, so it was kind of actually pretty intense. I bought this property that we're in. It was just a piece of dirt with a pile of concrete garbage on it. Um, had a couple offers on it that fell through, and I had the vision to do a multi-tenant property here, uh, like you see now, and we'll phase it out, and we've got actually, there'll be seven pads, but, well, there's seven pads, but we're gonna, we can talk about how that got pivoted. And um, I actually bought a piece of land with another buddy of mine in St. Norbert. Uh, we're building a big uh, apartment building there. And then um, in that same year, also found a property in the Exchange District that I had been working on trying to buy for almost four years prior. Uh, made multiple different offers, like like once a year for like four years basically, until we finally got it under contract. And really it was just the seller wasn't ready to let it go. That was what it kind of came down to, it wasn't really priced. And um, didn't actually plan it that way, but it sort of happened. And um, yeah, so that was about th three years ago, all those kind of came together in like a six month span. span. So you're saying while you're in California? Yeah. Uh, we we bought it before I left, okay. but the, all the development and that stuff started when I was away. Yeah, construction and on everything started when I was away. And you, you started the St. Norbert complex. The redevelopment, yeah. So that was like a we had to like amalgamate, rezone, get a bunch of variances. It took like two years just to figure out what the heck we were going to do with the thing. Yeah. Originally, I wanted to go in with an 18 plex because that was my first kind of multifamily deal. And my partner and I were like, okay, let's do like a townhouse. So we'd, we'd worked on a lot of those. Him and I had worked on about like 300 townhomes for a developer um, across Winnipeg, mostly in the south. And, um, and so we're like, let's just do something simple. We ran into all these things at the city where we just couldn't physically construct it on the site and in, in a way that the economics made sense. And so um, we did what I... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, I don't know what we were thinking. It was our first kind of foray into that, so maybe we were a bit optimistic, but uh, we did what any kind of rational guy did, would do, and we doubled down and, and we bumped it to 40, and then the, net, the, the numbers seemed to make a little bit more sense, um, which I'm being sarcastic. That doesn't necessarily make sense, uh, but that's what we did, and, and, um, and now we're finally underway. Yeah. Uh, you know, your wife got to go to school if you wanted to. Get your 
you made about 12 months out of the year for two years. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. So, I mean, that's I mean, that's often what you know people dream of doing something that they're passionate about. Sure, they have a good life, whether it's a partner or whatever. And uh, yeah, it just helps keep on doing it. And then you need to have a million to talk about it. And through that, a lot of growth is going to But that's part of growth, right? I mean, we'll, we'll talk more about that sure. later. But I just think that's such a cool story. Yeah, it's, it's pretty, I mean, it's kind of crazy looking back. Like, if somebody came to me and was, like, asking me for advice, I would not <laughs> suggest doing what I did there. That was uh, pretty intense. But uh, being on the other side of it, it's worth it. So, uh, yeah. Cool. So, right now, after the project, like, this one kind of looks done, but you've got all these different maps for me. Mm -hmm. go. You're going to be developing that. You've got Satan over How many years did you end up? Uh, 40. And then uh, on the corner of uh, Princess and um, McDermott. Mc is it McDermott? Or Bannatyne. Bannatyne, yeah. right. Uh, so that's a place that sits vacant and derelict for years. Yeah. With, with, a, with a crappy building that's all been essentially pulled down and rebuilt. That part's like brand new, but it's one building. How, how many units in that building? 39. 39 units. So um, what we did there, there was a three story building. And I don't know how many of you guys remember that building, but it probably was the ugliest building in the exchange. No, no. Um, it, it was uh, 108 Princess. Right across from the street where the nightclub Like r across the street from Citizen and right beside uh, the Fair Fairchild Loss. So th the reason I was, I was so attracted to that property is because the corner is heritage protected but the middle building wasn't because there was a fire in I think like the 50s or something like that. And they built this just nasty orange brick wall with these tiny windows that didn't match anything. And we knew we could do something really cool in the exchange that you can't really do anywhere else because there's not a lot of infill um, spaces left and heritage is increasingly difficult to work with. And um, that that is a big part of what motivated me to keep going on there because I knew we could do something kind of special. And so we actually tore the front off, built two floors on top of it, two and a half floors actually, and then I built another five and a half story addition on the back side and sort of just like squeezed, tried to squeeze every single ounce of juice out of that piece of dirt. Um, and that's kind of the theme of my projects. So I'm always trying to look like how do we leave like no skin on the bone by the time we're done for, for myself and for my partners. Like this piece of land, I, I remember sitting there for just like hours and hours and hours agonizing in um, SketchUp, which is a really easy program to use, but you can basically kind of like s situate massing on a set of plans that scale properly. And I remember looking at different configurations on like how do we sort of map this out and how do we get the max amount or a turn and fit the most amount of buildings on this thing while still um, having parking and, and space for the tenants. And so with Princess, we went from like, you know, if we would have just left it as is, we probably would have had only like 30, 30 doors, maybe a little less. We added an additional almost 10. Um, and uh, again, if you, you're not paying for any more land, it's basically free development land, and land is really expensive right now, really hard to find, especially good land. If you can add another couple doors on there, add another 10, 20% to that thing, your deal just got that much better every door you add after the fact. So. It's all rentals. Yeah. yeah. And the space is really cool. So if you're looking for a cool rental thing, if you know someone, this is going to be ready to let them in. June. Yeah, for occupancy, yeah. And can you say who the two commercial tenants are? I can't say who the one is. Um, and the other one, I don't actually know if I should say yet either, because we just signed it up like a week ago. So you never know. Uh, but yeah, it's fully leased, which is awesome. Really cool tenants. And um, 
uh, not what we were expecting. We thought maybe we'd get a coffee shop or something like that, but it was retail in the one and a tech company in the other. And uh, the, the and then 39 doors above with a mix of like twos and ones and a couple, a couple of bachelors, but most of them are ones, one bedrooms. Rooftop patio, underground parking, uh, under the building, through the building next door, so. I don't know, man. I, I, I am like such an entrepreneur. Like I'm always thinking glass half full, looking to the future. And when I kind of lock onto a vision, it's it's uh, sometimes to a fault, hard for me to let go. And um, with this one, you know, it doesn't cost anything to write an offer. So like I'll I'll throw offers at things. All not I shouldn't say not flippantly, because I I don't want to take advantage of people, but. The thing is, is like it doesn't actually cost you anything to write an offer, and for for me, that first offer was one that I was comfortable with, um, and I slowly, as my knowledge uh, increased and my experience increased, and my team of people around me, including my architects, like uh, mortgage brokers and all these different people that I'm working with, real t real estate agents, um, I felt more and more comfortable with the deal, so I was able to go up a little bit. Like I definitely went up over time. There's no question just even the market in those four years and the exchange just exploded from when our first offer went into the four years later when we actually got under contract. And um, so I was able to get more comfortable with what we were doing. And, and I mean, the reality is um, you just got to get in. Like at some point you just got to pull the trigger and, and get in. And this was a deal that made sense to me and my partners and, and it made sense to keep pursuing it. And yeah, like I just got a deal interestingly enough today under contract, for instance, that I've been working with. I wrote my first offer on a year and a half ago uh, with the owner, and I've been working with him almost monthly for a year and a half on a property that the guy's owned for his entire life, and um, just helping him basically let go. And sometimes it takes that, like if it's, and it's, it's worth it. I got a deal that's off market, freaking crazy cap rate for which is basically it's a really good return for the cost um, and but it took a year and a half of basically making nothing and potentially not getting anything at the end of it and still I don't own it you know I, I might still walk away when I dig into it even further I don't know yet but um, it's 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 worth it to me to work on that stuff This one, this yeah. one, yeah, yeah. Totally. I got two. This is crazy. Like it's crazy. Like just last week, I had a realtor call me, and I have certain criteria that I I've told a couple guys that I'm looking for. Like I want to find, um, like their industrial properties. They're fully leased, but their rents are below market typically because they're owner managed. So you got a lot of stuff around Winnipeg where maybe there's deferred maintenance, and that the the current landlords owned it for like you know 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and they're just happy to collect their rent. Like they're really afraid to 
work with the tenants to get the rents up and renovate it and, and add value back to the property and don't understand really how financing works, uh, you know, and, and the way rent ties to, va to the value and all these things. So uh, it's, I've been working on this one for a year and a half. I have a realtor call me last week and he almost offers me an identical deal, not quite as, not quite as big of a margin in it because it's through a realtor and they know what things are worth. Um, but I actually got two, I haven't had a, I have, it's, it's just crazy the timing of this, but I actually got two properties under contract within the last five days and uh, both are very, very similar and, and I might not buy either of them. Like I, I still don't know. But yeah, you got you got to get in there and try it because yeah, I, I think that's huge for people to understand. Like if you write an offer and they accept it, I mean, unless you're writing a non-conditional, which I, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know much about the single family home market. Like I don't know what you need to do to buy a house to flip it or a wholesale it or any of those things. Um, but at least with commercial, uh, guys understand these things a lot more so because it's, it's more of a business and you're making more of a business case within your offer. And um, typically, the guy on the other end understands that. Um, I, in my experience, I haven't done it yet with the, with the vendor take back. I've looked at it on a few deals. I had a deal that um, I had under contract for a few months last year and the numbers weren't making sense. So then we countered and we said, okay, well, what if you do a vendor carry for a few hundred grand or something like that? And it just, it didn't quite work. So I, I backed out on that one, um, which is always really hard when you invest a lot of time and energy and actually money spend a lot of money on that one with uh, getting an environmental report done and building condition assessment report done. Like there's, it's not just like I'm looking at numbers by myself once I remove conditions. It's we're spending real money on this thing, my money, not my partner's money, um, and walked away from it. So, but I've never actually closed on with a, with a vendor carry. I actually c looked at it for both these two, interestingly enough, these two deals that I'm working on right now. And it, by the time like I've, in my experience, and I know this isn't the case for a lot of guys, they've been able to negotiate better terms, but these two guys weren't comfortable with it. They both just want to like get out and move on. Um, n neither of them actually like need the money and both like, like some guys, they want that cash flow. They're cool with that. Like if it takes five years and they sort of like that monthly income that could come from a vent vendor carry, um, these guys just want to get out and, and move on with their lives. One guy doesn't even, like one guy doesn't live here. The other guy plans to move away within a year. And I was able to negotiate better pricing because of that. Sure. First of all, I mean, from all three, I want to say my, my big projects that we have on the go, none of them have, have hit budget yet from what we thought. And uh, in fact, not even close. Like it's, it's, it's frankly embarrassing. Um, the, uh, and, and that's hard actually, because what you, like what you said, I, I work with a lot of investor capital. That's how I've been able to build my wealth and my own personal portfolio. So typically I'm doing a lot of the work in exchange for equity. Um, and I'm really not making any money until they actually make money as well. Like I'm not getting plenty of money through it. And so, um, so you know, spending, for instance, uh, our project in St. Norbert, we bought that, thought we'd get that 18 plex, kind of skimmed over that. But there was a point where we thought we were gonna lose like half a million dollars because we didn't think there was a business to be made there on my first kind of major deal. I'd done a couple deals before that, that, you know, that uh, shop on Redonda and then the one on, on Marion, a couple million between them. But, you know, I did not have, and still frankly don't have a half a million dollars that I can just write off. And, and that's terrifying, you know? 
and this this project again like you look at what 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 a lot of people are seeing is the highlight reel they're saying look at the buildings look at the the projects you're doing or the money you've raised or, or whatever it is um, this this project this property was uh, way different than we anticipated um, actually when we went in we talked to a lot of the different commercial brokers in town we kind of got a sense of what the market was like um, we thought the location would be stronger than it has been and uh, the demand would be better than it has been and it just hasn't leased out the way we thought um, part of that is there's a lot of stuff happening outside the perimeter which I'm funny enough have some of that stuff with my family but uh, it's just simpler there it's less expensive for a lot of these guys to run out there so to be competitive in the city our taxes are higher here our operating costs are higher here um, and it's just not as competitive for somebody that's just looking at price so what we did on that was basically I had um, one of my other businesses that I'm a part of when this thing was kind of like right now we're about halfway done a year ago before starting construction on the next uh, building in the development I actually went to my group and I said hey would you entertain us building out the rest of this site for a single tenant and um, they said yeah that sounds good and, and the numbers weren't as good on paper but it would at least be a sure thing and so then I spent about six months working with another business that I'm a part of and trying to figure out the business model here and the financing for this um, helping like feeling if they're comfortable with it and and also all the while juggling um, my judiciary responsibility as a partner on both sides of trying to be like honorable and respectful and trustworthy to both sides and say and and be uh, as transparent as I possibly could through this process and through that all I was able to kind of like work to try to find aligned interests where it's like a win-win between it between uh, the different people the investors on this side while they waited a year basically hit pause on a seven million dollar project um, just to figure out if something would happen and, and fortunately it, it did come together in construction starting in like two months for the rest of it so, so how, how was that process uh, was a lot bigger than what you thought or, or was it smaller in terms of that shift because it, it really was a shift in your yeah. whole strategic framework yeah that, that was tough I mean it's tough because you're like I think pretty much anyone with their first partners for sure and even for me still like almost all my partners are people that I know personally really well like friends and family close friends and close family they're the ones that believe in you first because um, they know who you are outside right like they they know your character and and um, so I mean I, I didn't take that lightly I still don't and um, it was really tough when it wasn't producing the way that we had thought it would produce um, and so what I did is I just, I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to accept that this just won't work. I want to try to think about how we can pivot. And that's the same with that St. Norbert project. It's, it's like the numbers weren't making sense. And we just sat down and we're like, okay, what are we, what are we going to do? We're not just going to take it on the chin and, and lay down and quit. Um, because I know real estate works. Like it works. It's, there's no question. Um, but uh, it was, it was a hard work. It was a lot more money than we thought. That was painful, trying to go back to your guys and say, hey guys, you know, um, we had certain financing lined up and then we had to tweak it and basically renegotiate a different financing terms for this thing. And um, it's really humbling as the guy that's like putting this all together uh, when, you're, when your close friends are looking at you go like, man, like, like, how did you not know? Even if it's something that nobody could know, it's still, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. Um, we're going to wrap up here shortly, uh, um, but uh, be thinking about if you have any questions for him. I'm going to do a, a really short, rapid fire a question session with him, and then after that, uh, we'll open up to, to questions from you guys. So, are you uh, are you ready for a bunch of uh, questions sure. that we haven't talked about? Okay. Well, we haven't talked about. Yeah. Maybe. Oh, jeez. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> iPhone. Okay. Oh, I tried Android. Yeah. Couldn't do it. Okay. Anyway, that's okay. just me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, national chain coffee or a local hipster brand? Oh, definitely local. Sport local. Any chance you get. Yeah. For sure. It looks like you own one of the local hipsters. Yeah, no. No, thanks. Yeah. 
Yeah. Great. Uh, all right, what's your favorite on the go meal? Uh, you know, okay, so we have a parking lot in the exchange that's really close to uh, Chosabi, okay. which is kind of on King and Bantine. Yeah. And that's been my go-to because I can just park there. It's easy, and I don't have to pay, uh, which is not the case for everybody. But there's always, here's a, I mean, you can always just park and loading or something What's for 15 minutes. Yeah, uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, which we have some stalls available if you want. Yeah. Just can't put four on the market, but yeah. All of them. All of them. Yeah, like. I'd say though uh, it's probably Pantages. Okay, yeah, w which is not like I mean it's in the paper, yeah. it's not done, but it, that's that was crazy. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, Working on it. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Outside of real estate, what's your love? Definitely my family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got three kids, um, two, six, and eight. And uh, yeah, for sure. Besides Canada. My motorbike. Yeah. yeah. What, do you, what do you drive? I have a, a BMW that I run around in. Yeah. You mean my bike? Your bike. Yeah. 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 Um, what, what advice would you give to your younger self starting out? I don't even know. That's such a good question. I mean, the, f the funny thing, and I was thinking about this. We, uh, on my way in, um, like I've been approached in the last year helping other people figure out their developments, like just to be hired as a consultant, a development consultant for their project. So they found a piece of land. Let's say I have a buddy that's got a piece on, on Corden, for instance, that he's trying to figure out what to do with. And so him and I have made an arrangement where he's going to hire me. And I would, my first thought would be, well, find somebody like me and, 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 hire them to help you because it would save like if I would have hired me four years ago I probably would have saved myself literally millions and that's not an exaggeration um, but <laughs> I don't think I would have listened to that <laughs> and and frankly that's partially what brought me here too is learning that so so get a cons get get a professional I mean like it's cool hearing what you guys do it's it's huge like if you can shortcut your education save yourself like like tens of thousands of dollars for sure on some of these houses like I, I i don't know how you couldn't do it like i had a good support group i didn't have anybody that did specifically what i did and i definitely dodged a lot of potholes along the way um but i i i have a huge respect for uh, consultants in their field the professionals in their field whether that's your 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 mortgage brokers or your your real estate brokers or or this group here team made like it's invaluable yeah, definitely do it. Invest in yourself. So does anybody have got a question for Alex? It's a good question. Yeah, so we've done, um, I've set up a different partnership, like an actual, a corp, like a numbered corp, and then we just all buy shares. Yeah. And typically, um, we all own the same, like, the same, we all have the same voting rights within our shares. Yeah. So I, I haven't set up a limited liability partnership or a general partnership agreement for any of these yet, because they're typically, like, there might be only two of us or four of us, and everybody's coming in with, like, a lot of money. Um, and uh, and we all kind of decide together. The uh, going forward on these other ones that I'm looking at, my accountant's looking at some different creative ways to do it um, that are that are pretty cool. But uh, usually it's coming down to um, the, my accountant and my lawyer or our lawyers and figuring out what makes the most mass, uh, sense to those guys or to the group that's involved. Um, I think as uh, like some of these other ones that I'm working on, if somebody, you know, if we have like 10 people putting in 100 grand, you might then want to start doing that because it's tough to sort of manage 10 different or 20 different people. But when there's only four of you guys and you all know each other and 
all of them know me personally. It's uh, I think it's it, it made it's made sense for these deals to, to set them up where we decide together on some of the big things. The day to day is all run through me, but not a general partnership. Uh, my own houses, like, or you mean multifamily or? Yeah, so multifamily, yeah, we have these two, two projects that are about 40 units each, and then um, um, some more on that are going to be coming through the pipeline here soon. I mean, for me, and this is not for everyone, and not something I would recommend for a lot of folks, but for me, being in the construction background, most of my experience was multifamily construction or commercial construction. I just knew that world and still do. Most of my clients on our construction company side are uh, developers that are doing huge projects like Ironclad, Porchlight Developments. I don't know if you guys know those guys, uh, Seymour Pacific, and we've done a lot of work where I'm just used to that pace of construction. And something too that I've learned along the way is if you're gonna build something, like if you're gonna build a fourplex versus a 40plex, um, and this is a, maybe a broad stroke thing here, and so take it with a grain of salt, but like you're still only hiring one plumber, one electrician, one framer, um, and if you have the right systems in place, it's, it's arguably just as simple to build an 80 unit as it is to maybe build an 8 flex. It takes a lot longer, um, and if you screw something up, the, the fallout is a lot greater, um, but the actual work for me is is fairly similar other than that I need to raise a little bit more capital. But then you also gain economies of scale and you have stability. And I've always really liked that when you have multiple units, um, if you have one vacant, you're not 100% vacant or 25 or 50% vacant, you're 1 40th or 1 80th or, or whatever that is. And um, yeah, yeah. 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 So for me, I if there was a niche, it's to try to add value. So I'm always looking at a piece of property, whether it's an existing redevelopment or um, like like a like a building like these ones that I'm working on right now, for instance, this year um, that I just got under contract. Both of them are properties where there's an opportunity to kind of bring them up, and so we can add value. They're they're fully leased and they're stable, um, and there's probably a lot of people that would be comfortable just buying them and leaving them as is, but I see an opportunity to bring the rent and therefore the value up. Same thing with the redevelopments of like bare land or that building in the exchange district, for instance. I'm always trying to look at a piece of property if a realtor is bringing something to me or if I'm seeing something when I'm driving around town or looking online, I'm always looking with that lens of how can I add value? Um, and that's sort of the, I guess, the niche. And to your point, through that, Part of it is also learning like what's worked, what hasn't worked. So like the first, I would say the last four years, we've got these three big projects that we're kind of wrapping up. And then it's also take, kind of taking from that and, and I'm in the middle of it. Like my career is still pretty new, um, relatively speaking. Like I want to do this for the next like 30, 40 years if, if I'm able physically. So I, I want to try different things um, strategically so that I can figure out like where, like dial it in even further and further and further. But I would say if there's one sort of thing that I, I, I hold to more than anything else, it's to try to add value. 